Hello, Marty, and welcome to Stolaroid Stories. It's uh, Hello, Fabio. great to Thank have you. you here. Thank you very much. Uh, this is the first video interview that I'm that I'm that I'm doing uh, on my channel. Uh, so you're uh, the first guest to appear on on video. It's an honor. Um, it's very exciting. Great. Marty, would you like to introduce yourself Certainly. to our listeners? Certainly, Certainly Fabio. So the uh, short story is, my name is Marty, as you've uh, already introduced me, and I am Polish-Australian, uh, you could say. And then the longer story behind that is, I was born in Poland, grew up in Poland, and then we, my, my family decided to move to the UK. And that was my first real contact with English because prior to that, I mean, you know, primary school and middle school and as, as everybody goes through it that, you know, you learn some English, you have some lessons, but that mm -hmm. doesn't really cut it in the so, so-called real world. And so being in the UK was my first, wow, okay, I don't understand you, you don't understand me <laughs> kind of experience. So that was my, my first, let's say, real touch of, of English. And then after that, we moved to Australia and that's where, you know, I, I learned more and I, which is something that maybe you will find interesting, but I learned a lot of what I know from books as well. I used to love reading and I still do, uh, but I used to mm -hmm. spend a lot more time uh, reading when I was younger and I would read fiction and nonfiction. And I had this one book that I read maybe 10 or 15 times over and over again. And the first five times I read it, I understood maybe five words total of what I was reading, but you know, just looking at the words and looking at the pages was good enough for me uh, at that time. And through that experience, I noticed or I found in myself that this is not something that I want other people to experience as well, that struggle mm -hmm. and that hardship and that, you know, trying to find yourself in a completely different space, different language, different mindset of the people living there. And so now I'm an English coach and English mentor. I guide people to become more confident in English and to find their, what I call their, their English personality. Because what I found over mm -hmm. the years of, of teaching and coaching people is it is a struggle for a lot of people, of course, with grammar and vocabulary and so on. But what most mm -hmm. people come to me with and what their real problem is, is, you know, in my native language, I'm fun and outgoing and I love making jokes, but in English, mm. they can't do that. And so that is that internal struggle that a lot of people have. And that's something that I went through myself as well at the beginning that you know, I used to be a fun little bubbly kid and now I'm, I am not because I can't be. And so that, that is something mm -hmm. that I do now. I help people finding that in themselves. And as a result, I do, I, well, I did live in Australia for a long time. Uh, now I don't, now I've been traveling a little bit more, uh, but as a, let's say nationality, I, and we, we spoke about this before kind of a world citizen whatever that means <laughs> yeah yeah um yeah because i was on your on your podcast as well and i have uh, some questions because you said i um i have i so you went to australia but you don't have in into the uk as well but you've got an american accent so Good why is that? That is actually a funny story uh, because naturally as I was in that environment and with other people, I did pick up the Australian accent first. But then honestly, one day I woke up and I started listening to it and I thought, you know what? I don't really like the sound of that. That's just oh, not really my thing. It's just okay. the whole... I was like, no, we're not doing that. <laughs> okay. So from that point on, I, it just became my miss, mission to, okay, all right, what can I do to change that? That is not me, <laughs> or I don't want it to be me. 
how do I go about that? And it was it was a process, of course. And at the beginning, people or my friends mostly that knew the way that I spoke before, they were like, what's wrong? Mm. Something's changing. Something's going on. What's what's happening? Mm. <laughs> so they were very confused about it. I was like, no, no, we have to change that. So it was a very conscious mm. effort of, OK, I'm listening to, of course, movies and music and whatever and all of these types of resources. And okay, I'm changing. Oh, I noticed that it's the the R that's different. Cool. Okay, so I will mimic that R, or maybe the vowels are a little different. Cool. Okay, so I will do that. And it was a very you know step by step process of okay, I'll just focus on this, change that. Okay, I mm -hmm. like the way that it sounds. Maybe it's not very authentically. Maybe if I go to to the US, they'll be like, oh no, you're not from here. And that's mm, fine, well, but it's not mm -hmm. the Australian one that I disliked. <laughs> so that's enough for me. Okay, interesting, because the Australian accent is my favorite. And, you know, it's all a, a matter of taste, right? It all comes down to that. And it's also how, um, how you want to sound. If you want mm. to sound Australian, if you want to sound Polish, if you want to sound... You decide, you know, you decide. Um, and you said um, people come to you with um, with these, okay, not not grammar or vocabulary problems, but with a problem um, more related to how they feel and their personality when they're speaking, when they're using English, right? Um, so how, how do you... <laughs> Yeah, is that, is that right? I mean, I just wanted to say yes and no, because mm. from their perspective, that is the problem. And they come to me and they say, I need to improve my grammar. But then we work mm. backwards. What we were talking about, those levels of whys, you know, okay, why do you want to work on your mm. grammar? Why do you want to do that? And then it comes back to, okay, it's because I don't feel comfortable. So they do come with the vocabulary, mm. the grammar, all those things. But then it just works backwards to be something different. Mm. Okay, okay. And I know that you talk about the, uh, I've read it on your profile on LinkedIn, uh, the three pillars, mm -hmm. uh, the three pillars of, wait, I've got, I've got it here. Um, the three pillars, three pillars program, mindset, Indeed. knowledge, and structure. Indeed. Yeah. Can you tell us about the three, the, these three pillars? Because, mm -hmm. uh, I'd, I'd like to hear more about this. So mindset, knowledge, and structure. Indeed, indeed. So mindset is the first one, and that's what I am a firm believer of, that mindset is mm. or has to be the first one. And this comes back mm. to what we were just talking about, right? Whether somebody is mm. confident enough or whether they are motivated enough or whether they have the self-esteem to put themselves out there. And, you know, I have all this knowledge, I have the grammar, I have the vocabulary, now I need to actually start speaking to people. So then that is the, the mindset side of it, right? Then you have mm. the knowledge, which is the more technical stuff, what we were just talking about as well, right? The, the grammar, the vocabulary pronunciation kind of also fits into that. On the one hand, what, what you just said, it's all about how you want to sound. So to some extent, mm. it's also in the mindset that, okay, this is who I choose to be and this is who by that definition I am but it is also mm -hmm. the actual practice you know your mouth how it moves your tongue and so on so it is somewhat part of that knowledge as well and your structure refers to how you mm, structure yourself or your time so that would be time management that would be how you structure mm -hmm. your learning how you structure your practice how you structure showing up in the world so if we think of a mm. real life example of okay maybe i need to give a presentation for instance so okay mm -hmm. i need to have the knowledge of course i need to have the the powerpoint and so on i need to have the actual words to say i need to mm -hmm. have the structure as well right so what we were just talking about with okay i need to say this first this second this third so we can think of the structure in that way and then your mindset is these people want to listen to me and these people will benefit from what i have to say and that is typically the biggest problem that people have not necessarily you know building the powerpoint proverbially but actually giving mm. the presentation 
Okay, and would you say that these three pillars are, I mean, no matter what you want to learn, no matter what you want to improve, let's say I want to improve my writing, okay? Um, I want to write beautiful blog posts, for example. Um, you already do. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let's say I want to open a blog. Do do these three pillars apply to anything that I want to work on? So, mindset, knowledge, and structure. So, I guess I guess it would. I would argue life in general. For sure. To writing, like you said, we need the actual knowledge, right? Okay, so here are the writing techniques. Here are the maybe structures that I can use. Here are the beginnings. Here are the endings. Your structure mm -hmm. of, okay, I'm going to devote, let's say, one hour every week, one hour every day. I'm mm -hmm. going to maybe focus on this first and then I'm going to do this. So with writing, let's say, okay, I'm first going to focus on how I can become more creative and then I'm going to focus mm -hmm. more on how I can actually structure blog posts for SEO, for instance. So that's your structure of what I'm going to do, then your knowledge of actual SEO research in that example, and then your mindset of, is this good enough for people to read? Which again, I would say is probably mm -hmm. the biggest issue. Hmm. Okay. And do you have like a, do, do you, do you keep these separate? So in one session you work on mindset, in another session you do more of a, a knowledge work. So you teach, you help people with the grammar or it's an organic thing that, that, um, you know, there are three of these, three different strands, but they are three strands. So they, um, they're all connected. Uh, how does it work? Mm -hmm, certainly. I always try to keep them all together. And that, of course, depends on the individual. So if I see that, okay, maybe we are struggling a lot with grammar and there are mm. a lot of things that we need to work on, then I will start with that because it's difficult to have the self-confidence that, yes, I can do it. If mm. when you speak, everybody asks you to repeat yourself five times and then you don't really, there is a very big disconnect that, okay, I may be confident, but it's not really working. So then mm. building up that, you know, being realistic, I suppose is, is the point here. So if we do need to start working with the knowledge, we do that. If we need to start with the structure, it, and I and I hear this a lot from people as well, that they come to me and, and look, I've tried this before. Or maybe I've been wanting to take lessons for the last two years, but it's, you know, mm. oh, next week or, you know, I'll do that next week or I'll do that next week and so on mm. and so on. And then you wake up two years later and, oh, okay, now is next week. So sometimes <laughs> that's the biggest issue. Sometimes if I hear that somebody has really wonderful grammar insanely great vocabulary but there is still something holding them back what we were talking about uh, with uh, with our previous podcast with those advanced learners right that they mm. typically have good grammar typically have good vocabulary that's not usually their issue but maybe they're still struggling that maybe i'm not good enough right or maybe i still need to improve something and then on that mm. side it's mostly the mindset that we would be working with so it is usually a connection of all of them but there typically is a different balance and uh, have you ever felt um because you you were a learner as well uh of english so did you ever feel like that like you you couldn't really maybe you had great vocabulary because th there was a point for sure at some point you were an advanced student an advanced learner with great vocabulary and great grammar but did you feel like that like um i i st i'm still missing something like i i still i i still don't feel um myself when i speak the language as if oh, sure. uh, you know cuz your first language officially do you consider that to be polish polish right Okay, so the question the question is: yes. <laughs> Did you feel you were missing something at some point when you got to an advanced level? Oh, for sure, for hmm. sure. 
and I will uh, get to that. But first, can I tell you a little secret? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I now find with having used English for such a long time, I Mm. find that it's now better than my Polish. And Mm. I feel more myself with it, which I never ever imagined would be even possible. Um, but mm. as to, to what you're talking about, yes, yes, definitely. And I would say that, that uh, let's say, shift of what we were talking about before with pronunciation, that was a big thing for me because I noticed, you know, I'm here and I'm just this, let's say, shape or mold of the environment that I'm in. But that's not mm. really me. That's not really what I choose to be. So that was a big shift for me that, oh, okay, I can change that and I can still speak the language and people will still understand me. So that was a big thing for me. And then as, as time went on, I would say what really shifted that, you know, I'm myself versus I'm not myself versus now feeling more myself. And it's, it's easier for me to express myself in English now than it is in Polish. And where that mm. came from, I would say, was really developing my interests and my, let's say, hobbies also in English. So, for instance, I'm a very big fan of psychology. So what really drove that mm -hmm. was, okay, I would really love to learn more about this. And so I did all the learning in English because, and I'm sure to anybody listening, it's always so much easier to find materials in English than it is in any other mm. language. And whether this is Polish, and I've heard this from my Spanish students or Russian or whatever, English is the way to go when you want to learn something. And so through that, I learned, oh, wow, this is incredible. And this is awesome. And this is great. And, you know, the, the more I learned with that, and then I also started learning more about biology and chemistry and so on and these different things. And then I started noticing that I know more in English than I do in Polish, if that makes sense, that if you ask me about biology in Polish, then I would probably, you know, look at you and no. <laughs> mm. But in English, I, I mean, by no means am I a scientist, but I know a little bit more and more terms and, you know, more vocabulary related to it. So I would say that was the point for me that shifted that, okay, now I am myself. I can talk about myself, what I really love and what I find interesting in this language and hence I can be by definition that self. Of course, it took some time what I was talking about before with the jokes and with the, you know, being that humorous self. And that's also I find a bit of a different level and that did take a lot of time, of course, to develop. But now I feel I'm somewhat funny. Uh, so so with that, it did, I would say the biggest shift that I noticed in myself was doing the things that I really found interesting or inspiring in that language. Mm. Yeah, because th there are topics that I cannot talk about in Italian. Mm. There are topics that I cannot talk about in English. Like if we, if I had to talk about football in English, I would struggle. Like I don't know the terms uh, because I never, I've never watched football in English. I've never talked to my friends in English about football because uh, when I went to London, I already, I didn't really care about football anymore. Um, whereas I cannot talk about, I mean, it's not that I cannot talk about language learning in Italian, but I would would find it hard. Like mm -hmm. a lot of vocabulary in English would come to mind. Yeah. So, um, yeah, it, it's all about what you've been exposed to. And um, I guess this is like now, do, do you ever use Polish in your life? I do. I do. With my parents, of course, with my family, I do still have friends in, in Poland. So I do still use it on a daily basis. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Okay. And... Do you have uh, advanced students as well? Advanced clients or students? Do you English or Polish? Or, or I mean, your your students. What what levels are they? In English, I would say yes. It is not the norm. However, certainly yes. So most I would say fall between that 
B1, B2 range. And I was actually um, talking about this to another um, guest of mine on my, on my podcast. I think you said you watched it. I was talking about it to Helena. And we were mm. talking about the fact that most people, or at least most younger people now, are not really beginners in English, even if you've never really formally studied it before. I mean, all the music and the TV shows that you're exposed to, you're not really a beginner anymore. So I would say that's also a, a big impact on, on who I teach. So it is mostly that intermediate, higher intermediate. I have had, of course, some more advanced students. And then what we were talking about before, it's more so the actual mindset, the motivation, the consistency that really goes into bringing them to that mastery level. But mm. on, by and large, I would say B1, B2 is the largest average. Okay, okay. And I was wondering if there is anything in in our field, in our industry, which is language teaching, if there's anything that you really dislike or, for example, um, when I'm, when I was on Instagram, I used to see a lot of videos, a lot of reels. And to be honest, I don't know if you, <laughs> maybe this is what you do. I don't know. Cause I, I haven't checked your Instagram cause I'm not on Instagram. I hope I'm not saying something <laughs> that you disagree here. Or maybe, or maybe, well, if yeah. you disagree, it would be yeah. great. Uh, those um, videos like basic English on on one side, advanced English on the other side. I, I was, I, I came across one on YouTube the other day. Uh, there was a guy saying basic, advanced, basic, advanced. And this is one thing that, I think we don't need, okay? Learners don't need this. Learners or um, people in general who are learning languages, they don't need to know, I mean, what, what does that mean? What does it mean that this is basic and this is advanced? To me, this is mm, useless. So this is one thing that I dislike about our industry let's 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 say like let's say like that is there anything that makes you go why 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 are they doing this or <laughs> they should stop doing this yeah? i would say probably a lot and actually something different came to mind but what you said also yes drives me crazy when i see it because it just comes back to those lists of oh memorize these hundred verbs for next lesson and it's basically the same thing that you have 10 words here and 10 words here mm. and okay memorize those and you're like what am i supposed to do with that you know mm. these are just words i could google that myself and that's not really something that i find insanely valuable and the reason why I think it's so ineffective is because it doesn't give any context. And I like those posts that have some more advanced vocabulary and that give maybe some sentences or that maybe give some excerpts from TV shows or movies or something like that, because advanced vocabulary is great and you should be able to know it if you want to. Of course, what we were talking about before that not everybody needs to know that, but to the people that do, more power to you. If you can learn it, awesome. But just giving those lists, this is basic and this is advanced. Okay, but mm -hmm. can I use it in the same context? Can I use it in the same sentence? Should I use in or off or at or to? And there's just nothing actionable about that. So that mm -hmm. is definitely, <laughs> I think you're very right in that it's just something that should really stop. Um, but something else that I was thinking of and maybe more in the um, mainstream, let's say language teaching that I really really dislike and i probably talk about this a little bit too much with my students but the textbooks and how complicated they make grammar and then everybody thinks that grammar is super complicated mm. which is one of the biggest misconceptions that i think 99 percent of people have and the one percent that don't is the people that have learned it in a different way and know that it doesn't have to be hard because if you look at a textbook and i always love the examples of tenses because that's where i see it most of the time with again 99 percent of the people that come to me that okay mm -hmm. i don't know how to use the present perfect 
okay, great, let's work on that. But then why is that happening? And then you look at the textbooks that they've been using and there are 20 different explanations and oh, if this is happening, then you should use that. But oh, actually, if this is the case, then here are 20 exceptions. And then you're here wondering, oh, well, why can't I use the present perfect? Well, it's probably because it makes no sense. <laughs> Mm. So something that I am an avid advocate for is making it as simple as it can possibly be, because it really is or because it really can be. If you really look at, okay, when do people actually use this, not when textbooks use it, but let's say, okay, here are five TV shows, here are five episodes, when do people use the present perfect? Okay, well, they use it when they talk about their experiences, when they talk about movies that they've seen, and when they talk about their last holiday. Awesome. Let's start with that, because 95% of the time, that's what you're going to be using that for. Obviously, that's an oversimplification, but the point that yeah. I'm making here is grammar doesn't have to be hard, and mainstream education seems to love making it hard for some unknown reason to yeah. me. Yeah, because it's it's teachable you know it's always that thing that you can easily teach not easily but it's something that you you can explain the role students can learn the role and then do the the exercise it's very easy to easy to do in class mm, yeah. and it doesn't require i mean you said it it's in the textbook and there are a lot of rules and sometimes the rules I've had in my experience, people asking me, but how can I remember this rule when I'm mm. speaking? Well, you don't, you don't need to do yeah. that. You don't need yeah, to remember the, the rule. If you start, yeah. um, um, try, if you, if you try to recall the rule, then the conversation would, would drop because you're thinking about the rule. So uh, I'm not saying that rules are not useful because I studied a rule and actually that was mm -hmm. something that I, I really liked studying the rules, but that was just me, you know, it was just me. I don't know, was there anything that you really liked doing? Like I, I really love doing exercises and studying grammar and studying uh, not vocabulary lists, but doing those vocabulary books where the, you have one, uh, you've got words on one side and mm. then the exercise in context and then exercises on the other side. Did you have anything that you really loved doing? Because you said reading before. Reading was a big one for me and something that I really enjoyed. And I've been seeing more of this now, but one that particularly comes to mind was, in, and this was in those somewhat later stages, not the very beginning, but I found these books that had two pages and one would be super simple and the other was the original. And then you would see, okay, you would try to read the original first, but then it's maybe some more complicated vocabulary or something. And then you have the entire page just written in a simple manner. And that was really hmm. great because you don't then don't have to sacrifice the entire meaning of the book or the entire meaning of what you're reading. But you can just, oh, okay, so this is what that is. And sometimes, and the reason why I really appreciated that, and it wasn't just the single words explained, sometimes that's really great, especially, again, if you're at a higher level and that is all that you need. But if you're maybe somewhere in the B1, I would say, maybe a to b1 maybe somewhere in between there mm -hmm. and sometimes that single word is not really enough for the whole context of the sentence and i really appreciated having the entire page in that let's say quote unquote again simple language and then later on i found that they do the exact same thing with shakespeare for example they have the original oh. shakespeare play and then you have it just you know modern english which makes a lot of sense in that context, right? Because I mean, who art thou and, and so on and so on. So that's nice <laughs> to have it in just normal words. So that's something that I that I really appreciated. But also I've always loved listening and whether this mm. has been music and I know that a lot of people mention music, which I believe is for a good reason, but whether this was radio or whether this was TV shows or movies or so on, I loved the sound of it. 
which is very interesting for me to think back now because I suppose maybe you would have had the same experience but when you're younger when you're listening to English songs you fit in your native language words into it and then you're like oh I have no idea what you're saying but it sounds fun yeah <laughs> and then hearing those songs 10 years later and you're like oh so that's what you were singing about <laughs> that was my one of my most favorite things <laughs> cool and um I wanted to ask you something not related to language learning because you said you like psychology. Um, what exactly do you like? Because I like psychology as well, and I read books about um, psychology. For example, I've read uh, Nonviolent Communication. Huh? Uh, but this is actually, I don't know if you know this book. It's it's Classic, brilliant. Sure. Um, and I've read, what else have I read about psychology? Um, uh, this one, the psychology of persuasion. Mm. No, no. And then quite, have you also read persuasion? Big, but... Sorry? Have you also you read persuasion from the same author? From Cialdini? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Pre-suasion. No? no? No. Very good. Definitely recommend. Hmm. Okay. So, yeah. What, what books do you read about psychology? Or what do you like uh, exploring? I don't, I don't know if you like exploring particular topics. Sure. Sure. Definitely. Well, it started in quite a different place than it is now because it started for me as the very, let's say, general areas of psychology and what i mean by that is looking let's say at abnormal psychology so the things like maybe depression and anxiety and those things and then it also morphed into developmental psychology which i found more hmm, not that I found it more interesting then, but it's probably not really a huge focus right now, but looking at children's development and okay, for example, the stages of Piaget have always been interesting for me because you can very clearly see that if you have a lot of children around you, which I don't, but in the circumstances that I do, it's interesting to see, you know, which ones fit into it and which ones don't. So definitely that side of, you know, little humans and how, how they develop into you know, fully or not so fully functional adults later on. Um, but something that I very much enjoy about psychology right now is on that side of what, what you just showed, nonviolent communication, a very, very interesting book. Persuasion, pre-suasion is also very interesting. What it looks at is the state, you know, what happens before you try persuading somebody. And a great hmm. example that he was giving in that book, for instance, looking at real estate agents, that if a real estate agent was trying to make a deal with somebody, then, you know, they were, you know, taking them around the house and whatever. Um, and then they would go outside and the real estate agent would say, oh, hey, I'm, I'm sorry, I left my keys inside. Can you let me back in? And then he would go back inside by himself to grab his keys. And what he was saying there is that that requires trust i mean you don't let somebody into your house if you don't trust them by themselves mm -hmm. and then this was before you know they started the negotiations and all of these things and that was that little step beforehand that oh we know this person and we can trust this person more subconsciously right they probably weren't thinking of it at the time but what you can do ahead of time to set yourself up as that trustworthy person Super interesting, definitely recommend if you haven't read it. But also something mm -hmm. that I've been going into more so recently is the mm, the subconscious side of psychology and something that I read very recently in, called Psycho-Cybernetics. I don't have it with me, I, I only have the digital version, um, but insanely interesting. Psycho-Cybernetics, it basically looks at how your conscious decisions and your conscious goal setting affects your subconscious what what they refer to it as the car the self-driving car in your head and if you give it the proper road the proper directions 
then your subconscious takes care of actually making it happen, which plays on the idea of the secret. I'm sure you've read that book as well, right? That idea of visualization and creating your own reality before it actually happens. Have you read The Secret? No, or maybe I seen the movie this. documentary? The Secret? No, really? No. I think you'll enjoy it. Like, is this one of those books that, you know, one of those bestseller books that everyone knows about and now and and I'm I'm the only one who doesn't know about this book like it's like saying comic yeah anybody listening is like oh no he hasn't read that book <laughs> yeah because there are times when yeah. you know you say oh okay you're an English teacher do you know this guy you know oh, very famous yeah. in our industry yeah. no no, no, impossible. No. So now I read nonfiction books, and you're saying <laughs> you don't know this book about. So I feel the same thing. Do happened. you feel challenged? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, no, but I'm no. So I'm this is kidding, a book that you would recommend. I would. I would. Psycho cybernetics, cyber like internet cybernetics. Super interesting. Yeah, basically into what I really liked about it is, you, you know, that idea of again, coming back to that, you know, mindset knowledge structure, this is very heavy on the mindset side of it. But mm. if you, you know, keep thinking, Oh, no, I'm not good at it. And this is not gonna work. And oh, they're gonna laugh at me, then they will you are literally creating your own future with those mm. thoughts and psycho cybernetics are that self driving car that they're talking about in that book is making that happen. It's making and it takes your thoughts and it creates that reality for yourself. And how this manifests is not even necessarily affecting other people's behavior, because that would be very spooky. <laughs> but it affects how you see their behavior. So if somebody is smiling at you, you may see, oh, you know, they're super friendly, or oh, they're making fun of me. And there are always, you know, two sides of the exact same situation. So it more so works in that way that you just see your reality and hence you're creating it in a sense okay yeah because we we're very good storytellers mm. aren't we even when you know when these things happen uh people say oh no i'm, I'm not a good storyteller where well, actually you tell a lot of stories yes. every day uh, and they're all going uh, into your brain um okay um so you read about psychology I guess we, we should uh, maybe record another podcast where we talk about books, only about nonfiction books, because <laughs> as sure. I understand, Let's do it. You are, you're a nonfiction reader, right? Enjoy it very much. Okay. How do you read? Like, Because um, I find it hard sometimes to remember what I read, and that's one of the reasons why I also want to uh, organize book clubs. Um, sometimes I take notes. Now I've started um, highlighting things. That I've always highlighted things in books. But then when I finish the book, I transfer those notes into a, a document, text document. Just manually? Um, manually, yeah. Okay. And it's a way to process the information mm. again. And it's also a way to try to remember um, the key concepts from the book. But then, of course, I think I read somewhere that the best way to remember what you read in books is to actually do what the books uh, that would make sense. advice, you know, <laughs> to implement the advice. And I think I've, I've done that with, with most books that I liked. Like this, I read a book about storytelling and I started telling stories. Then um, one about Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. Do you know that? Ego Say no, because yeah. I, I want to. Oh, you know it. Okay. Uh, I need to find a book that you don't know. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, the best thing is to apply what you read mm, in books. For sure. Do you have a system, like an, a note-taking system or any other system to remember because nonfiction is all about sorry self-help self-improvement 
And in general, nonfiction is all about, you know, learning about the world so you can improve. This is my, sure. this is why I read. But if you then don't do the things, well, why are you reading? Hmm. Sure. So what's your, uh, I think that we're, we're going into another, another podcast episode here, but well, we'll, we'll start be now. Continued. <laughs> yeah. And, and then yeah. We'll, we'll continue in the yeah, future. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I have honestly, over time, this has morphed for me because I used to be very big on paper books, but then mm. the more I've moved and the more I've traveled and the more things I've had to throw away or leave behind, I've noticed that for me, that is just not very viable. And I can't have a lot of physical books with me because they're heavy and they take up a lot of space. Mm. <laughs> so I've moved into more digital and I've also started noticing, and this is actually, this has been a big surprise for me because I was never really big on audiobooks because I could never really focus on them but recently yeah. I've started noticing that I'm getting much better at it so I guess it's just practice mm. but what I really like about audiobooks is as I'm listening I can take notes and then I don't have to put it aside and take out a notepad or something like that but I'm just listening I close my eyes I'm listening to it and if there is something interesting then oh okay I either pause it or, or I let it run and I just take a note and then when I'm done, I have this stack of notes and I personally, and this is something that I've been struggling with for a long time, I really hate disorganized notes because then I feel like it's everything and I, there is nothing in it at the same time because hmm. there is just too much going on and I get lost. So I really love organizing them and I have a lot of different sections for, let's say, my social media, for marketing, for my lessons, for, for you know, for different things. And then I'm running through it, then, okay, this would make sense if I took it here. And then, like you said, that, let's say, retranscribing it really helps you to internalize that, okay, maybe I took note of this, but what am I supposed to do with that? You know, mm -hmm. it's a great quote, maybe, mm -hmm. but is it really helpful for me personally? maybe not scrap it get rid of it don't waste your time on it if it's useful cool can i use it in my teaching can i use it in my social media can i use it here can i use it there put it in that appropriate folder and then when it comes to let's say creating something for my podcast or when it comes to creating a lesson i can oh cool that's been interesting maybe i can try to implement that so audiobooks have been my thing recently cool yes i've never listened to an audiobook because of the same reason, I feel I mm. can't focus. And I don't want to listen to an audio book while I'm running or while I'm, yeah, you know, no. as a podcast. No, I just sit down and, yeah, okay, yeah I can't do okay. that because then I can't take notes and mm. it's like, okay, I've listened to it for an hour, but I have no idea what I listened to. So, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try, I'll try this out. Okay, Marty, um, where can people find you? Because you've got a, YouTube channel and a podcast and a website. So basically I'm answering your question, my own question. <laughs> so people can find you on your podcast. <laughs> yes. Where, yes. Where definitely. Else? Yeah. Uh, so I've got a, a, a bio link that's going to make it all super useful, which is marty.education slash bio, B-I-O. And like you said, my website, my podcast, my YouTube, my Instagram, my Twitter, LinkedIn, all of these other social networks, they're, they're all in just that one link. Okay. I'll make sure this will be in the show notes Wonderful. and in the YouTube notes as well. And thank you so much for joining Stolar Right Stories. Uh, the next thank episode you, will be about books with you. Sounds we good. can I'm talk about the three most um, life-changing books that we've read Ooh, and that's why. A good topic. And, yeah. Cool. Looking cool. Forward to so it. we've already we've already got something planned <laughs> for our next meeting. Thank you again, Fabio. It's been an absolute pleasure. Great. Bye, Marty.